interview that Tremaine did, which is fascinating. I want to check this out with you. He did an interview with Business of Hype and he sits down with Angelo back and they have an in-depth conversation. I'm going to play this for you now because I'm really curious to see what he has to say about everything going on now because it's been quite a meteoric rise for the old Tremaine. Um, he's gone from being a relatively unknown person to being a key person behind the scenes to having a little brand of his own with no vacancy in, with working with Virgil, with Kanye, and now he's become a fully fledged designer in his own, you know, for, in his own kind of shape, which is cool because. You know, from the time that I remember Tremaine being in London, I remember him being kind of the Mark Jacobs guy and just being around town and shit. But he never really struck me like somebody that would be a designer. I never really got design vibes from him. If anything, he kind of reminded me a lot of Heron Presson, that kind of cool guy around town sort of thing, which is iconic, ironic because <coughs> him and Heron Presson ended up being two of the biggest designers in the sort of street where men wear Jason sort of scene. So props to them for like making it work. So I've got a video here courtesy of the YouTube channel Business of Hype where Tremaine and Angela back from Awake NY sit down and shoot the shit. I'm going to play and react to it right now. What's up? How's everyone doing? My name is Angelo Bacche. I am the founder and creative director of Awake New York. And today I have the pleasure to be uh, accompanied by someone I consider um, not a friend, but a best friend. Best friend. Best friend? and uh, this uh, journey that I've been in for over 20 years. Um, he's a multidisciplinary, some might say a jack of all trades, master of some. <laughs> I bring to you uh, Tremaine Emery. Tremaine, if you don't mind taking a few seconds. He does look, bless him though, he does look a lot healthier. Um, Tremaine had some pretty gnarly health issues that he spoke about extensively i think in gq on his instagram everywhere he was fucking talking about it um so most of you would know especially if you've watched some of my content and he did look very sickly um there was a picture of him actually with his top off i think for one magazine and he looked really 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 skinny and you know but like in a in a sickly way not in like a good way and whatever it may be so it is good to see him looking a little bit more plump in the face looking a little bit more alive i'm sure selling a hundred thousand cotton reef hoodies in an hour probably helps but he does look a lot better now Thanks to i guess give your version of who you are and what you do to the listeners and viewers cool yo thanks for having me man pleasure to be here with you um tremaine emery and i am a designer artist founder of denim tears creative director of denim tears co-founder creative director of no vacancy what do you do when you have your own brand like that you have your own brand that makes clothes would you call yourself a founder creative director or you just call yourself whatever role that you do the most the, or does it even matter what your role is it's your own brand you make clothes you started it yourself out of your bedroom does it matter if you say you're the founder obviously you're the founder because it's your fucking brand why not just say you're the creative director no i don't know yeah cool so, T, what we're going to talk about today is just kind of like um, doing a little kind of like pullback and, and viewing of like the, the past, the present and the future of, of streetwear and fashion as a whole. So I, I think let, let's start with the past, you know, like um, what changes and what shifts have you seen in the last five years happen uh, in our world? The main changes I've seen in the world of you know, creating clothing, guys and girls that look like us, um, and from where we're from, creating this this reluctance to fucking be okay with doing streetwear is so annoying. Fucking hell. Clothing is um the interest from big money, big mm. brands, and how can we help big brands sell their items or promote their products or uh... i would love it in the future if there's a scenario where denim tears gets bought out by like lbmh and stuff of all the things you said about you know um white supremacy and supreme being a white supremacy organization and him being very pro-black and wanting to talk about the black experience of denim tears i would love it to see what the internet would say if he got himself in a situation where like lbmh bought out 
or bought the majority stakes in his company or something for millions and millions of dollars like what people would say online like okay so you hate the white man but you're all right with taking their money yeah all right cool <laughs> um, how can we be at their fashion shows or so on and so forth you know like so many things so it's um it's been it's been interesting um across the board across music across art you know i mean it's all art but <clears throat> what society considers what's art what's music and what's you know fashion clothing he's still pissed off that people won't let him get off those slavery t-shirts isn't it uh, what's art like he's still pissed off he doesn't like that people wouldn't let him get off those fucking uh t-shirts he won't do for supreme featuring a guy that was obviously whipped on his back i think it's an art piece i've got the artist's name don't get me you know don't fucking scream at me but he's still pissed off that the internet didn't really agree with his idea that that shirt needed to be done with Supreme. You know, I still don't understand why he never thought, why he never realized that wasn't a good idea. It still kind of boggles the mind, but whatever. Um, seeing, yeah, just seeing our tribe, like, go places we've never gone before. Mm. Right. But also seeing things not change that much. So that's been like, the kind of like, I think that's the tension where it's like, so much has changed, but then so much hasn't changed. Like, um, you know, let's say how does certain designers are referred to, not they're not seen as just designers. You know, stuff like that hasn't really changed much. It's been it's been you know it's been that way, and it's still the perception of certain designers versus others. Um, yeah, but that's what I would say. The big change is just seeing big corporate conglomerates and companies interested in what we do because we've been i think that's always going to be a thing i don't really see the complaint i don't really see why that's a sticking point i think the sticking point was always or the really big hurdle to get over as a person from my as a person who isn't fucking white would be just to get in the conversation to have the ability to be able to present your ideas at the highest level and be, you know, have your brand stocked on the same shelves as some of these illustrious brands, that was the main mission. Now that everyone's done that and everyone's got a voice, obviously you can evolve and kind of build from that. But this idea that, you know, there's we're going to reach a point where they're not going to refer to a streetwear designer that's black as a streetwear designer instead of design, referring to just a designer if it was white that's never going to change in the same way like in football um if there's a black player who's very fast and aggressive they're going to say they're raw but if there's a white player that's very fast and aggressive they're going to say they're tenacious they're going to say they're fucking aggressive aggressive or something but they'll never say they're raw you only got to get that raw tag if you're black or brown it kind of just is the way it is um but i still think the main aim of the game when it comes to street or when it comes to fashion is that most of these guys that look the way they do that talk the way they do that dress the way they do have the ability to communicate their ideas at the highest level um they're able to galvanize a fan base or galvanize a customer base whatever it may be a community um telling their story um unapologetically without filters that is the biggest win and now we have companies who are tapping up these guys wanting to collaborate and they don't even try and they don't censor them they don't want them to kind of get rid of their edge they actually want that edge they're actually happy with the edge within reason that never happened in the past. So I think that is the major win. And that's something that people should be kind of, you know, um, patting themselves on the back with uh, or just kind of celebrating because we've come a long way because that wasn't the case all the time. Been doing what we've done, yeah. right? I met you in front of the union store over 20 years ago. Union, you know what I mean? So me and you and our tribe of people, we've been buying the books, watching the movies, have I been involved in 20 years? I put, maybe I've also been involved 20 years, you know, because I've, I've known all these guys from when I was fucking 19 and shit, 18. So maybe I've been involved for 20 plus years also. I never really think about it though. You know, it's not, you know, it doesn't really matter what, like I'm at what, what, what am I going to carry around a tag that says I've been into streetwear since fucking 22 or 2002? Who gives a fuck? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like this idea that that matters in any way, shape or form is always kind of hilarious to me, but... I guess, you know, people like to, you know, um, let people know that they've been on before they've been on. You get me? Go to film forum, whatever, you know, whatever it is, all the things we've been doing that. So it's just like maybe I guess the commercial world is caught up in the last five or 10 years. Yeah. Kind of late. Yeah. Caught up kind of late. 
but that's what they do best you know yeah but, um because yeah what what we did back in you know 99 and 2000 was considered underground the things that we're into the music we listened to the art we were in we were mm -hmm. into way before any you know contemporary rapper decided to like shout out basikia in a lyric like that was our favorite art you know that yeah. was our hero you know what i mean that was somebody that you know i looked at as being like the original like counterculture disruptive like fucking up the art system yeah um and kind of having this plan like a marketing plan you know what i mean like yeah. if, you, if you really studied what he did like like he 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 worked the system to his benefit right um and when I think about the last five years, kind of like, you know, echoing what you just said, you know, I remember there was always this wanting validation from luxury, mm. right? You know, like, especially for where we come from, the school that we come from, especially like school of design and things that, you know, um, we thought, oh, I, I'll speak for myself. I found aspirational, right? That I wanted mm -hmm. to be a part of. I thought I needed to be able to like reach up and take a bit of that. Same. And, right oh, and and i i feel like it's been flipped around in the last five years where like you're saying is like there's a not yes from the big conglomerates there is a necessity for to tap into our world to be able to communicate to this new uh customer that they're trying to tap into yeah um uh, but i think that first line even before we get to the big conglomerates has been luxury I think what he's saying here is true and it's something that I've always hated and I don't think it's changed that much. I still think there's too much of a reliance, too much of a looking up at and gawking and fucking licking the feet of the fashion illiterate, the fashion glitterati and industry people when in truth they don't really give a fuck about us streetwear people, right? They just kind of use us for kind of clout points and cool points and shit but when it comes down to it they don't really care and they would rather we get out of their little space. Um, you see all the time whenever a streetwear person is hired as a creative director for a big luxury brand the reaction from the fashion people isn't the greatest so i don't really understand the love and affection they have with it um, even to this day you still have a lot of streetwear brands going to paris and having their showrooms on at the same time that paris fashion week is on especially for men it becomes like it's paris fashion week men's has now become the unofficial bread and butter it doesn't take place in Germany anymore in any other European country. It takes place in Paris. Paris has now become the place where all these streetwear brands, menswear brands, go and set up their studios and their showrooms and try and basically advertise their wares to, like, you know, retailers and whatnot from around the world because they all come down to check out these fashion shows and shit, which is still shit. I still think there should be a specific thing just for the streetwear slash menswear crew. And the fashion thing is the fashion thing. Um, I do remember this one particular time this was back in the day when I was keeping an eye on Palace. I don't really fuck with the brand anymore like that at all. But I remember one time when they were first coming up, there was a really cool feature they did in Vogue for them. And I think it was like when they were called like PWBC. So when they were kind of that, that, that was what the crew was called and the brand was Palace, right? And I remember, I think, I forgot who the, pho the photographer was, but it was a really cool like ed editorial they put in Vogue. But I remember when they did it, it was around a time when, you know, Palace was maybe, I don't know, two years in, three years in. It was kind of bubbling on the underground. People like myself were obviously on it from the jump. I think I purchased the first two tees Palace ever made. I actually bought them myself. I, I remember one particular I bought was when they used to print their shirts on, on inside out t-shirts. So they, I don't know what the methodology behind it, maybe because it's the only ones they had free or the only ones that were kind of scrap or cheap, but they would get t-shirts and they would print on it inside out. So when you wore it, you had the seam exposed and shit, but you had the logos on it and whatnot, right? So I remember, again, it was kind of bubbling on the scene. A lot of the kids that I skated with were wearing Palace. A lot of the people that were involved in streetwear and whatnot were on it. And then they got this advert, the editorial in the Vogue magazine. And then I remember seeing them, maybe it was on Instagram, seeing people associated with Palace and shit, like losing their mind over the editorial on Vogue like people on like the sidewalk skate the sidewalk forum right sidewalk magazine forum before it was changed to the skate forum we're going crazy about this vogue editorial i was like bro like this is nothing to really get that excited about because number one it's just like a look cool but also these guys don't really give a shit about you like you know it's not really that deep really unless maybe they were all excited because it meant that you know skaters were going to get their dicks wet with models and shit I never understood why people were really flipping over and getting really excited, almost getting a boner because Vogue decided to take a picture of one of their hoodies. It really doesn't make any sense. The validation should come from the community of kids who had no idea who these guys were before. 
they put out a tape they put out some t-shirts and suddenly they're all on their dick that should have been a validation not like vogue shit you know what i mean but i could be wrong yeah you know and you know for example like shout out to you for you know working out working on a project with dior yeah you know i to me it's a fucking trip i'm when i when i saw you posting like the the banners of the photos of the campaign and like one thing I've gotten quickly, I know I keep stopping it a lot. They don't really talk that much. He says they're best friends. They don't really have that many conversations. I get the feeling they don't really have many conversations. <laughs> so I don't know. Maybe I'm reading too much into this, but I don't think they're best friends. Like Aoyama, right? Or like or, or Moto Sando, you know, like I, I, I know exactly where those banners yeah. are flying. I'm like, that's huge. Yeah. Yeah, man. It was, um, it was, it was a trip and super grateful. I only, and I, it's funny you bring it up because it's just like, I was thinking about it What's he gonna this say? week because Kim had his show. White Man Bad. This week. White Man Bad again. What's he going to say? Um, <laughs> couldn't be there. Okay. But um, it was just like, interesting because it was more so like, for me, it was like the relationship with Kim. You mm-hmm. know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You know, he's something we all, we all, you've known him. We've all known him for a long time. Interesting fact about Kim Jones. He used to actually work at Goodhood, right? Back in the, not Goodhood, um, Give Me Five. So he's a so he's been, he's been basically in the streetwear scene as long as many people, myself included. So he's really deep. He's really fucking deep in the trenches. So big up Kim Jones. Good dude. And seeing a re- friendship and respect and then him seeing me cut my teeth and become a designer and then build a brand and then the brand game, you know, get get going and then him being like, hey, you want to collab? It's um, pretty amazing, you know? Mm-hmm. And um, outside of the business side of it, you know? But um, I definitely still, I don't think it's hit me. Maybe like I gotta see like the, I don't know, in twenty years, see someone wearing like a beat up Dior tears like shirt or something like that, and then I'll like it'll really hit me. I think it's like I just think also because what I've been through the last year with my health, you know, as you know, I was in the hospital when that collection ha- um, was uh, premiered in Egypt and stuff. So I feel like I haven't really taken it in or like maybe I put it somewhere in my brain, right? Because I was like I had so much basically more important things going on in my life so it's kind of like it's like a black spot for me mm. but i'm super proud of the collection i love seeing people wear it and i love the- must be wild isn't it right imagine being like life is fucked up like that isn't it imagine having one of the best periods of your life career-wise collaboration with your your brand is selling out more than ever all these opportunities coming at you and then you also happen to go through one of the worst times in terms of your health. So then when you think back to that time, you can't help but remember how bad you felt and how close you were to death. But it was also a really good time for you career-wise. You know, it's hard to kind of separate those two things. It's like, it must be awful. That exists. You know, I got, Dior was generous enough to give me an archive of all the items. So I have it in my archive. Mm. So it's like, just a little stuff like that. Like, Amazing. I, you know, one day when I have a kid, be like hey you know i did this that's really cool because not a lot of brands do that when you collaborate i've heard a lot of people say sometimes they don't even get a piece for themselves they have to literally buy them from the store or get someone to send it to them specifically but they don't actually send you it like here here's the whole collection thank you for collaborating here's something for you to kind of keep a hold of yeah you know i mean you have to kind of request it so the fact that they sent him sent him the entire collection they did with dior is really good i didn't really personally like it personally if i have to you know, put out my feelings there. I thought the Dior Denim Tears capsule collection was pretty shit. Um, maybe the shoes were okay, but I didn't really care for it, to be fair. But it's a good look for him, to be fair, to be honest, especially being somebody that's not like a, you know, a classically trained designer, hasn't been in the game that long. To get a collaboration with Dior this early is fucking sick. The standard third, it's, um, and I did it with a friend. And that's kind of what it all comes back to me. Not downplaying the whole Dior part of it, um, but stuff, you know, I've done with you, Kim. I could go a list of people. That's like the beautiful part for me. That's where I try to find my validation. 
into working with you guys mm-hmm. <clears throat> and getting like kudos from you guys. And try, I'm trying to, I'm working on myself to not seek validation from the things I used to. Right. Because it usually fails you. You know what I mean? Whereas you got, you don't feel, you know, you, you're a perfect example. You you don't fail me as a friend and as a as a comrade, you know? Yeah. So. Yeah. I agree with that. I think in general, it's very difficult to do so because being a fucking creative and artist in my own right, I've always had aspirations of like winning the Turner Prize, for instance, right? But I know that if that never happens, that doesn't define my career that doesn't define my legacy you know what i mean but growing up um you know you see these accolades as sort of like a a marker a sort of like indication that you've done it that you've made something of yourself that you're achieving things that you're where your peers were blah 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 blah. but in actuality that's never really the main goal that shouldn't be the main goal the main goal should always be about just getting your ideas out there, being able to communicate with, w- being able to communicate your ideas to a wider public, being able to kind of grow a fan base, a community or whatever it may be, or people who are into the shit that you're into, being able to connect with people, maybe make some friends, um, being able to share your pain, whatever it may be. All those things are probably way more important than validation from these t- type of places, especially when you think about it, more often than not, if you focus on the actual work, and you focus on internal validations, internal pats on the back, or from your peers or whatever, whatever colleagues in the scene, you actually inevitably end up in a position where the industry, where the you know the gatekeepers and whatnot, all these big people, they end up acknowledging you anyway. So if, when you don't want, when you don't focus on it, it happens. When you focus on it, it sometimes happens, but it doesn't really hit the same. So you're probably better just to focus on yourself, focus on the work. And then kind of, you know, do stuff to impress your friends type of thing or to kind of make your friends go, oh, my God, sick. And then from there, if you get recognition from the big people, then cool. But that's not the necessary thing. It's not the important thing. And if you were even if you did tell me one day, we could talk about it. You know, what I mean, there's compassion and care there. Right. Vice versa. You know, so that's what um over the last couple of years. That's like really focusing on that, you know, so. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm always good for sliding into Tremaine's dms like once a year to be like i i need that <laughs> what are you, what are you <laughs> um and if you don't and I, i'll totally step off the subject mm-hmm. but if you don't mind because you glazed over it really quick and as someone that's been as close to you all these years you know um it wasn't tremaine just being in the hospital tremaine had a, a near-death experience yeah yeah over a little over a year ago yeah um and it, it was you know it wasn't my experience but i'll tell you right now like as as your friend you know as your brother you know like it's it's something that that rocked me it scared me because you know unfortunately we've lost a lot of friends over the last couple of years mm. um so yeah you know like for me to work with a brand like dior would be like a top 10 moment in career and life but then you know, you're going through this this period of like you're you're literally fighting for your life. Yeah. You know, I I, wa- I was there. You're I wa- there. I was there. You know <laughs> like what I mean? Literally there. <laughs> yeah. You know, do you mind speaking on that moment of like yeah, having that experience? Yeah. No, of course. Um. Yeah, I mean, it was just like the best of times and worst of times because like I got to see the the love that people like you and Andy and A-Side and so many people, Chris, whatever, I could name Anthony, my man, Anthony Spector, you know, so many people, a group, small group of people gave me in my, you know, my greatest moment of need, my dad. And so that was the beautiful part. The horrible part was going through the experience, you know, being in the hospital for three months, Jesus, almost dying three times in those three months. And, um, the recovery, which is still, mm. still part, every you know part of my life every day, might be a part of my life for the rest of my life. Uh, but you know, the main thing, Lo, is gratefulness. Mm-hmm. You know, even like coming here, I was like, damn, I remember Lo coming to see me at the ICU. Lo coming to see me when I was in between ICU and rehab, coming to see me in rehab. I remember you went away. You came like, yo, I'm going away for a bit. I just wanted to come see you before I go away. You know, all that is like. Uh, it's beautiful memories, even though it was super, you know, 
it is like you said it wasn't you like you're like wasn't my experience it was because i do feel even when you asked me the first question about the last five years i i the other thing that came to my head is like the last five years there's been a lot of loss especially these last uh. two or three years you know with the names that people know mm -hmm. because of their celebrity and also names people don't know mm -hmm. you know like sponto who everyone you know people know sponto people know v and you know megan who you know we just we just lost um you know brian's partner and megan uh, yeah, yeah our friend and rest in peace megan, you know yes. so many people that are part of this um this thing of ours are gone i think that's another thing i've really uh made me want to just uh enjoy the people more than the that's the thing that really does suck about getting older to be fair that's the one of the worst things about getting older is just that your friends your family people the people around you the people that you know and love just you know going away and sometimes it happens in the most brutal fashion especially like you know with my situation with my um good friend joshua sweeney r.i.p to him but we weren't even on good terms before he passed. Like I hadn't spoken to him in maybe a ye years, probably maybe a couple of years. We hadn't had an actual conversation because of some falling out of some nonsense. And then I get a text suddenly in the morning from my other friend, Bobby saying, Oh, jo Josh passed away. It's like, what? You know what I mean? Like we were literally like, you know, together all the time for a very long period of time when we were growing up. And then all of a sudden he's not there anymore. You know what I mean? Um, really fucking crazy and those are one of the worst things about getting older is that people just leave your life sometimes and you have no control over it obviously and sometimes it happens at the worst periods of time possible when you're going through something with that person or maybe you take for take them for granted maybe you stop answering their phone calls whatever happens and suddenly you don't get a chance to say hello again you know what i mean that's a really really fucking brutal thing and i also think about lifestyles um i've you know it's pretty clear and pretty obvious that I live a very fast lifestyle. I've speaking about it. A lot. I've spoken about it a lot. I burn the candles at both ends. I kind of play hard and party harder, and I'm sure a lot of that also plays into it, right? Especially if you're chasing your dreams, you're living your life. You're you're li you know you're chasing your dreams. You're living your dreams. You're in your dream career, and you basically get to indulge in anything that you want. You get to travel the world, you get to eat at all the best restaurants, you get to drink as much drinks as you want, have as many drugs as you want, party as long as you want, with little to no responsibilities because it's all part of the lifestyle, it's all part of the image. And then sometimes that does have some, you know, some bad consequences. There are some negatives that come with that sort of lifestyle, maybe, who knows, that plays a part in it, I'm not too sure. But either way, losing people is just awful. Like, I've kind of realised that, you know, I've kind of started to realize why people say grief never leaves you because it really doesn't. Like there'll be times legitimately where like I'll just be, you know, doing my thing and then suddenly I'll just think about Josh, it'll just pop into my head and I'll just start crying. You know what I mean? Out of the blue. But then when it happened, I didn't really cry, I didn't really show much emotion. But then afterwards, like literally like a random time, I'll be in the shop somewhere buying my groceries and I'll just start bawling into tears and shit. I have to fucking cover my face and no one comes up and, you know, touches me or whatnot. Um, but yeah, um, RIP to those who we lost. RIP to all those we've lost. Stuff. So, you know, that's that's what I think the main thing, having that lower aortic aneurysm and almost being out of here mm. was just like enjoying the people. You know, obviously we still can't see each other as much as we did in our younger years because of we have more responsibilities mm -hmm. and we have families that we help take care of and take care depend on us so it's not like back in the day where like you come to london and i see you like you're london you're in london for seven days i see you four out of those four or five out of those days you know it ain't like that anymore but going, going to scotch go yeah going to scotch <laughs> doing you know dj you know putting together parties for no reason yeah. like angela's in town put together a party you know what i mean for freeze or whatever so um it just made me lock in to the people that were really there for me mm. and also made me be like well make sure i'm there for people when they go through their thing yeah you know that's the main thing i learned from that and then yeah but also to the dior thing i think it made me 
I always have perspective. So that's the thing. A lot of people are like, oh, did almost dying give you more a new life perspective? No, because I grew up, you know my pops. He's a talker. Mm-hmm. He's a Southern philosopher. You know what I mean? So my dad always was um, kicking to us and my mom about the importance of living in the moment and not taking life for granted and having fun. You know, and it, it could end at any moment. So I didn't gain that perspective. I did gain the perspective of, you know, when we're like when you're in the hospital, you come hang out with me for two hours or however long. We wasn't talking about clothing or mm. any, we, you know, we were just talking about us, life, or whatever, you know. So it definitely did make all of it less important to me, you know. Not that I don't I mean it make me want to quit or anything like that, but and then even like it didn't lessen my drive. I still got the like. The hunger, but it just, as far as the result, I'm still going to work my ass off and do my best to my abilities, but the result don't matter so much uh, to me. The The peanut gallery, the critics, this, and also the adulation don't matter as much because I, I got pulled out of it for like a year. You know what I mean? Literally, you know, I was on injured, res- <laughs> injured reserve I was just out the game for a minute, just watching, and it gave that gave me a different perspective. The life perspective I had done already, as far as the perspective on the game, you know, like I I never put myself in a situation where stress is um I'm stressed out. You know what I mean? Because it ain't it ain't worth it. You know? Right, it ain't that serious. Yeah, right? and and um you you focused a lot on you know post facing your your own mortality and how it affected kind of like life but how did it affect your creative process now and work i gotta be more strategic with my time you know do because of my, my um, physical therapy regimen and and you know one of the keys to my recovery has been sleep mm. Mm. so you know I didn't sleep a lot before, you know, not because I was out partying every night or anything like that. It was because mm-hmm. <laughs> I, was, I wasn't out partying every night. But a lot of it was just, you know, up late, up early and on a lot, a lot of flights. So, you know, that's that's been curtailed where it's like. That's one of the that's a mad decision, right? Like when you're not doing anything, when you've got nothing going for you. You envy the people that you see online who are always posting, <clears throat> you know, pictures of a new boarding pass, pictures of their legs crossed in front of their luggage, on the way at the fucking gate and shit, sitting down in first class economy, whatever it may be, catching flights, cashing checks, right? You're like, fuck, I wish that was me. But inevitably, all these people say the same thing once they do do it a lot. They always complain about how bad it is for their health how bad it is for their mental, how bad it is even for their relationships. The amount of people that I've kind of spoken to or heard speak about, you know, when they're uh, you know, ascending in the scene and starting to make it, and they all say, oh shit, it fucked up my relationship. My girlfriend broke up with me. My fiance broke up our engagement. My kids don't speak to me anymore. I don't really see, I mean, all these type of things get in the way because unfortunately the really, really sad reality of life is this. When you're chasing your dreams, when you're really going for it, when you really want to make a name for yourself, when you're really trying to actualize your potential, when you're really trying to make good of the gifts the Lord above has given you, you're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna inevitably hurt some people. You're gonna inevitably not be there for some people. You're gonna inevitably just not be around. And those type of things you can't reverse. And then of course, it's gonna might impact your health. There are some freaks out there that are okay with it, right? I think Virgil is a good example of it. When I was working with Virgil, like, I remember he would be catching flights from, like, Chicago to Paris on, like, the daily, on, like, the weekly, sorry. He'd be, like, commuting. He'd be using a plane like an Uber. Like, that guy was, like, and he never really looked like it got to him. He never really complained. He'd be, like, going from meetings to meetings to meetings to meetings in different countries, like, not really batting an eyelid. Some people are made for it. Some people are built different. But I think for the majority of us, like, you have to be careful what you wish for. I know sometimes, you know, it can't, it's not where you want it to be. 
with your career and you're kind of struggling or you're kind of trying to figure it out but be careful like if you, if you like the life that you think you want you might not really want it you know <laughs> be careful it's all got to fit within me getting my, my nine ten hours of sleep oh exactly don dutta you put it there correctly don dutta in the chat you put it there correctly there health career family choose two of the three you don't get three you get two you have to choose two and be happy that the other one you know and be content that the other one you're not gonna be able to get so health career family choose wisely choose only two big up don dutta fit within me doing my th three days of physical therapy um me eating and getting the energy and yeah just not pushing it anymore you know so that that's and if i gotta like miss out on an opportunity or something like that then you know what i mean so so be it you know um still work hard still you know in my office in my office every day mm -hmm. um but just within everything within reason you know yeah and um and i and i urge that for my my colleagues my employees too is to work hard but also take it easy right also it's made me um think about time in a way in a way what do i want to spend my time doing because um yeah it's a, you'd have to you'd have to experience it you know it's like you have to just be that close to being out of here and then it's like some reason you get a chance that most people don't get um a second chance mm. actually i got like a second first second and third chance and like a as you know you were on those group text group text messages you were there second first and third chance so just about using my time How do I want to use my time? And also the legacy. What's the legacy I want to leave with my work? Mm -hmm. But most importantly, with people. Because um, even that, at a funeral, no one really talks about your design portfolio. People talk about type, you know, how funny. What, what, how, kind, of, what kind of human were you? Yeah, how funny yeah. were you? Yeah. He helped me out. Yeah. You know, he gave me a hug when I was crying, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. We had fun, you know. So mm. that's, 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 so they gave me, I definitely think about that too i think what you said is true but i think this new generation gen z's will definitely be talking about each other's design portfolio their content calendars um their rollouts <laughs> their marketing plans i think the gen z will definitely be the generation that does that at each other's funerals <laughs> They'd definitely be like, oh my god, I remember the fit he posted on July 29th, 2023. That shit was legendary. <laughs> when he fucking matched the fucking, you know, the cap with the big pants and the leather jacket. Like, for sure the Gen Z will do that. They will definitely be talking about that at each other's funerals. The time I spend. So, you know, now my main priority is like my wife, my health. And my wife and my family and friends and then work, you know? Yeah. Um, I can't say that was always the case, you know? Because I, I had this drive, especially after my mom died, I had this drive to prove, you know, you, again, you were there. You, you and Shaq and Rod sent flowers to Harlem, Georgia for my mom's funeral. I remember I still got the card. Um, but you probably even seen the difference from when my mom was alive to after she died. Like... You know, just the drive of like, I had something to not prove, but to her not, her all the sacrifices she made for my entire family, not being vain. So that was really my drive to what the world has seen the last, you know, my mom, be February 18th would be nine years since she died. The last 10 years, people, the work I put out across every artist or brand or thing I've done with A-Side or Virgil or with you or blah, 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 all the stuff I've done, it's been like, the drive was been, it was tunnel vision, you know what I mean? That's kind of brutal, isn't it? That drive pushes you to the point where you you create denim tears to what it is now, but then that drive also brings you to the brink of you losing your life. Fuck, man. Chasing your dreams is really, <laughs> is really make or break, isn't it? 
Is it, when 50 said get rich or die trying, he wasn't lying. He fucking wasn't lying. Yeah, if, if, and correct me if I'm wrong, what I'm hearing is like, it's, it's one thing to view a family member or a close friend passing away and then it makes you reflect on your own mortality, right? And then it, it drives, because that's what's happened to me. Yeah, you know? yeah. With with V passing, Spanto passing is like oh like I gotta I gotta go hard yeah. But then when it's your own yeah, when it's your own experience yeah, you know, I feel like it's not so much ego driven, right? Because for me, I, I, I that's a great point. That's a fucking great point. That's a really great point because I had the same feelings when fucking Virgil passed, and obviously my friend Joshua Sweeney passed. Like the same thing. Of like, oh, I need to go harder now. I need to fucking make sure that I make the most out of this short life that I have on earth. I mean, I can't go out without actualizing my potential, without fucking, you know, um, making good of all the gifts and talents I've been kind of blessed with, all this sort of nonsense, right? Really me, 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 ego, 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 ego. Then obviously when it happens to you, the person, it becomes completely different. Your brain's like, oh shit, I need to slow down. I need to start savoring and enjoying the moment. I need to start being present. I need to start appreciating those around me and not complaining about the things I don't have. The brain, man, the human brain. God damn. I admit that it's mm. ego driven that I need to go hard. Why? Because I need to make more money or I need to do yeah. the best, you know? And it's not like what I hear for you is just like this firsthand experience of, you know, um, your time being up here. It's as actually like softened your existence. You yeah, know? yeah. And being able to prioritize what matters most yeah yeah right straight up you know um no nah, definitely 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 softened it you know because it's like an example boom i moved back to new york february february 14th 2022 and my dad lives in new york and me and my dad have a great relationship he lives in fort green we were seeing each other get him out but really how much was I seeing my pops? When I got sick, he was in the hospital, you know what I mean, every day. Wow. You know what I mean? Six o'clock, he'd come wow. in to 11 wow. and hang out. So it was like, I was like, damn, man, we, sh we should have hung out more. Uh. You know what I mean? We should have went to more Yankees games, da, da, da. So that's just an example of like, you know what I mean? I wasn't, I wasn't, I was, I was just so focused on, you know, I was doing pre- Working on that Dior Tears collection. I just finished up my last Stussy collection. Working on Denim Tears collection. Oh, oh shit, he was at Stussy. So all that good shit I was seeing at Stussy, he was also involved in it. Fuck. All these, all this, you know, preaching mm -hmm. to the choir. So on a flight every other week, da da da. So it was just like, so that's why when I got sick, I remember when I was handing an aneurysm and, you know, and I was waiting for the EMS, I was like, damn, man. I was like, I got a little brother, as you know, um, McCoy. He's turning to be four this year. And um, I literally, the, my two thoughts was like, I just, need, not not now. I, I want to, I need more time with McCoy and Andy. That was my two things. Like, mm. you know, I just started, you know, dating this woman who's now become my wife. And then um, my little brother. The wife thing was really bad as well, by the way. The internet is fucking awful. You can be pro-black and also marry people that aren't black. I think that's perfectly okay. Um, the fact that the internet was going after him because, you know, he said what he said about Supreme and then he ended up marrying this very white lady was really, really insane and really kind of disgusting and gross, really. I hope people could chill out with that shit. It was like, damn, I need more time. I want to I want to hang out with McCoy and I want to spend more time with Andy, you know what I mean? And that was Michael from Africa. It was also more so everyone that I, that I love in that way. Like, I love Andy, love McCoy, love you, love my dad. Just spend more time. So that's, yeah, that is the thing that has softened me. It's just like my thing is now is like I still want to be a great prolific designer, artist. Mm -hmm. But it has to be in balance with um, enjoying my friends. I'm enjoying it. and also my own personal things Tremaine like to do dolo that have nothing to do with none of this stuff you know listen to, I don't know listening to, like I've been listening to Thin Lizzy all week just you know what I mean just like cool that's just my thing boom bought, buying some vinyls doing some research on the band da da da, da. just has nothing to do with nothing and um making time for it man yeah. making making time for it making time for everything 
you know you you always surprise me with your, your musical choices I, I love uh whiskey in a jar and uh of course the boys are back in town it's yeah like, always like the like bro anthem but you always crack me up oh i remember the first time you uh you post the replacements i was like what the fuck Jermaine knows about the replacements? <laughs> 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 uh, but you know Tr- Jermaine, you know like um you know watch watching you watching you grow as a as a creative the last couple of years um and and to be like you're saying like our tribe and our collective you know we we've always been big on intention right putting mm-hmm. intention in the work and intention in design and you know the messaging that we put out there and i remember one of the last conversations um that we had together as a group with v i remember he he coined us like the the native tongues of streetwear right because yeah, he kept saying that yeah he kept he kept calling us the native tongues of streetwear and us being from queens like that always resonated extra yeah. hard because you know tribe and for me like tribe was always the lighthouse it, exactly you know to me it d- doesn't get any better than those first three albums but classic after classic after classic i think i wish there was ability i'm actually tearing up thinking about it because oh, i still remember good times i wish there was an ability to kind of capture the moment everybody listens to tribe called quest the first time like just to capture the magic, the sparkle in everybody's eye when you first hear a tribe called Quest. Like, it's just magical shit. Magical, magical, magical shit. Like, the first time you hear Can I Kick It? The first time you hear Scenario. The first time you hear fucking Electric Relaxation. The first time somebody ever hears Check the Rhyme. I would love if there's the ability to capture that moment. Because wow, man, what that what what that group did for me when I first discovered it, when I first discovered them, sorry, music never sounded the same. It was a, it was a good benchmark also for my you know taste and stuff, but music never sounded the same ever again. Once you hear a tribe called Quest for the first fucking time, it's magical, 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 man. What uh, yeah, incredible. Um. And the reason why I bring that up is like when people ask me about like post, you know, my, you know, post leaving Supreme, you know, what has been one of my biggest, um, I would say like achievements. And I would say it's, it's bringing like some kind of consciousness to streetwear. Right. And, and the work that we do. And, you know, for me, it's, it's been on give back. And for you, um, what I, I told you recently, you know, like to me, you're hands down the best storyteller. In street oh, man. I, th- I think there's some that's something that nobody can fuck with you on that you know and specifically you know um being able to tell the you know the black and african-american experience you know through clothing and through design and i always feel you know like mm, i disagree i think as much as i enjoy his i think i i respect and enjoy more his courage to do the things that he does with clothing because he could easily do things a little he could easily be a little bit more subtle he could easily like play a bit more in the middle but he's very outright very intentional very forthright about the things that he speaks about the things that he displays on his clothing right about the was it was it what's a banner called at, at fucking um the dead and tear store it's like the what's it say on the top the african diaspora goods right african di- diaspora goods that is essentially what the brand's all about. But I don't think it's a great storyteller. If anything, I think the storytelling is a little bit too literal. You know, it's a little bit too brazen and brass and in your face. It could be a little bit, not even subtle, it could be a little bit more, um, there could be a little bit more cuteness to it. It could be a little bit more chic, a um, little bit more subtle. It doesn't need to be so like, you know, but I could be wrong. I always go back to like PMB Nation and, you know, like, <laughs> These, clo- these these clothing brands from like the early 90s that would Easter egg information yeah. like on the back of the tag, you know, yeah. they have like a Huey P. Newton quote. And yeah. so then now I have to go figure out who Huey is, you yeah. know. And for us, we have to really put the message out front in order for people are, to receive it, right? Yeah. Yo, big up uh, Wingus McDingus. I've turned off notifications. Usually when I do my tag show, I like to just to kind of ramble into the air um, and kind of do it a different style from what I do, the random show. So there'll be no notifications popping up. But if you do 
send any donations or any flipping super chats i'll of course read them out at the end but big up and um, wingus mcdingus i'll read this out now um you said rap more like c rap thanks dallas that's my time <laughs> bean cheese 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 so big up wingus mcdingus appreciate you um that i say all of that for this question is like you know where do you see um on a scale of one to ten where do you see like the, the morality the level of morality in streetwear right now um zero <laughs> great question i appreciate that compliment it means a lot to me coming from you a lot it was bugged out at the awake strobe and then a dude had on an absurd absurd t-shirt yeah that blew my mind i bought that t-shirt from union 20 years ago anyway answer your question um i think i think that i think that there is a lack of parity in you know you want to call it streetwear, sportswear, whatever you want to call it. Um, there's a lack of parity in the the um, intention of the clothing, you know. And it, the thing is, it's like it doesn't always have to be the way me and you do it. Or let's say like, you know, um, it's just like intention. And it doesn't. So you can convey the POC experience without it being like red, black, and green. Mm -hmm. Just in the fact, you know, it's even like there's, um, you know. Glad he said that. There's a, I saw a trailer for a film called. Glad he said that. With um, Jeffrey Wright in it. And he's a writer. And he goes, I'm black, so the book is black. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, it's like, it can, you can convey who you are as a, person of color, a woman, queer, whatever, mm -hmm. just in a, a, myriad, a myriad of ways. I just don't know if that's being done. I don't know if people are coming from the gut. It doesn't have to be fist, mm -hmm. pro anything, but just, I don't know. I don't feel it coming from people's guts. I think the reason why it doesn't feel is because most people don't have anything to say. I would love there to be a situation or a place in life. Like I think I see a lot with parties. There's a lot of like parties that kind of center around the LGBTQ plus scene. They just, they just like, if they don't have, if they can't sell queerness, they're not really about anything. You know, that's the main thing they're selling. We're a queer, we're a safe space for queer people. Safe space, it's like, bro, okay, we get it. But apart from that, what else are you presenting? What else are you offering? What else are you showcasing? What else are you talking about? What do you stand for apart from just representing LGBTQ plus people? There needs to be a little bit more intention behind it um, by just the way that you move, you operate, you talk, whatever. All that stuff is kind of, you know, by the by. But I think in general, people just don't have much to say. So if they can jump on a bandwagon, jump on a slogan, jump on a fucking phrase, a hashtag to say what they want to say, they'll say it. it's like the It's like emojis. Emojis kind of, you know, give people an opportunity not to say words. So if you don't want to say words and you're lazy to actually formulate your sentences or your thoughts, use an emoji to make up for it. But you don't actually say anything. Same with memes. You don't actually say the words. You just let the meme kind of speak for you. But I think when it comes to creative expressions and shit, you kind of need to be vocal and forthright about what you mean to say, what you want to say. And then, of course, over time, let that kind of like seep through your consciousness, let it seep through your body and whatnot. And the way you walk becomes what you're about also, not just when you speak. You know what I mean? Your presence is always sort of felt in that regard. And, you know, sometimes you just can't, you got to meet the, the person. Um, and then, you know, then you're like, oh, actually it is. But from what I'm seeing, from what I meet, I'm not seeing, you know, much of it. There are, there are, there are, you know, there are guys and girls out there doing it, you know? You know, I, I do feel like where we're at is like, 
we're a little rogue squadron, you know? Yeah. People always laugh at me. I always use Star Wars yeah. um, parables, but it'd be working, you know? George was onto something, and I feel like the bigger thing of what's going on now is like the Empire, and then you have the rogue squadron, little brand, you know, Awake, you know, Denim Tears, Beast Joy, Cortez, you know, Bravado, so on and so forth, Barriers. Barriers. You know China what I mean? You know, yeah. I could keep naming some more, some more, you know, Wells, Bonner, Martin, you know, Martin Rose. Martin Rose. Um, there are brands out there that are. Um, and, and not to get too, I also want to be able to acknowledge the brands coming out of uh, West Africa, too, you know. Yeah. Uh, Freely Youth. Yeah, yeah. You know, so like I see some of our influence because they tell me, so I'm not trying to take credit, you know. But yeah, like, yeah, yeah, those, yeah. Those cats tell me, you know, like how we've been WAF, like all yeah. these like, cats coming out of Lagos and, yeah. and Accra, you know, like. Yeah. I learned, I only learned, I learned about them thanks to Grace. You yeah, know what I mean? Doing, doing the home, home, you know, shout out to Grace and Sosa, the home, doing, going homecoming. out there twice, homecoming yeah. twice. I hope to now that I'm healthy to be able to go out there again. Um, yeah, so I just think it's a little rogue squadron of guys and girls that are yeah. making me fit. That's my whole thing. It's just like you don't got to tell stories the way I do or the way Lo does, but just come from the gut. And whatever that is, you know, that's what the game needs. The game needs the feeling, you know. Mm. Obviously, we got to run. We got to want to run our business. Want to and need to run our businesses in the black and make be able to pay people's health insurance you know, me and you on the same wave, like we take care of our employees yeah. to the best we can, mm. you know? And um, so we need to put out products that sell, but you know, there's a way to do that. And still um, the stuff going on, you know, the world's brutal. The world is a dark place. And um, I think it takes talking about the human condition across everything to to uh, help change things, you know? Agreed. Not just on CNN. But, you know, everyone, I'm not saying it's everyone's responsibility. I know people just, some people are just like, I just want to do my thing, have fun when I'm making clothing, and that's it. That's cool. I have fun when I'm making clothing, too. Every 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 story we tell with our clothing isn't a sad story, you know? Yeah. Even that, like I hear that, like, Didn't Tears is, you know, talking about black trauma all the time. I'm like, no, I'm not. I got stories about Alvin Ailey. Homing in the projects with the tiger, <laughs> so on and so forth. You know, like there's lots of beautiful, fun, you know, weird stories that I'm telling that have yet to come out yet. And some stuff is about, you know, the the um the cross the, the, the cross the plight of slavery. But it's not every that's not the whole that's not the whole brand, you know. So um he's, like, he's heard your complaints, he's heard your complaints. He doesn't just talk about whips and chains. <laughs> Like every awake thing isn't about fuck the system. No. You know? You talk about all kinds of stuff. Yeah. And sometimes the stuff you talk about that you don't even put it on the nose. You just have to really it's like an Easter egg. Same thing with Denim Tears. I don't there's stuff that people buy or get because every single thing I design has research in it. I just don't mm. always put out there break down each um each uh Easter egg all the time because it's like who has time for all that? <laughs> so it's, it's interesting that you bring up um, so that Je that Jeffrey Wright film is American fiction, and I actually went to go see that a few weekends ago. And yeah, you know, some unfortunately, like some change doesn't really happen. This change is this change that yes has happened in the last five years. You know, post you know George Floyd and you know um, all the social and kind of like. Um, and like kind of like racial challenges that have happened, you know, and that's kind of um, pressured, you know, um, you know, these systems have changed, but they really haven't. And yeah, you know, white people still want to like feed into like these narratives, like where they're the savior, right? You know, mm -hmm. um, and uh, you know shit you know the i i still deal with some of that shit too you know like right now as as someone that's you know trying to have their business grow and and you know as a creative director and you know like you know frustrations of like you know 
I help build a billion dollar company, you know, like why isn't my phone ringing, you know, post leaving Supreme? Yeah. You know, you know what I mean? Oh, I never thought about that that way. God damn, that's true, isn't it? Because Angelo too, Angelo similar to, um, what's his face? Noah Babadzian, who's obviously head of Noah NY and, and is also the creative director for J Crew. Those are the two people that I remember being that the, at the at the, you know, those are two people that I remember when I remember when I first got into Supreme. Um, those are the two names that were really important over there. Those are people who are really put in Supreme on the map, um, through all the things that they did, special projects, designs, whatever it may be. Um, I still think that era of Noah and Angela working at Supreme was probably the best in terms of the quality and the level of stuff that they were putting out, and obviously their work laid the groundwork for Supreme ending up being the billion dollar company that it is now, being bought out for what it bought out for, whatever it may be. So you can imagine him thinking he's one of the most high profile people there. He was maybe one of the only faces there you saw publicly on social and shit. He was out and about doing his thing, tapped in with the NY scene, tapped in globally with the streetwear scene, had his own previous brand. I forgot what the other brand was called as well. It was a really cool brand. Um, it was like a I remember because I had like an army green t-shirt from them time ago I've got the name of it but yeah can you imagine how that feels then and then your phone stops ringing or oh, it's not ringing anymore damn and, and, I, and I see this other creative director using the same photographers I use that I helped build same stylists that I helped build using the models that I helped find but uh. yet y'all ain't calling me yeah you know what I mean so you know, the you. whole point of me isn't I'm not here trying to like harp on my, <laughs> my yeah. story, but the, you know, back back to you. You know, is kind of like what what have been some of the challenges that you face, like these kind of like you know systemic challenges. Yeah, you know, as as a creative, I uh, um I get example. Um, there was a brand, uh, a clothing brand collaboration brand that I liked wore and they're like hey we want to work with you I was like cool so we're going back and forth so we're in the final stages of like getting to the point where it's mm. like you know that last talk before something gets signed mm -hmm. so they're like so I told them my idea and then they were like we were thinking we wanted you to do a black a black history item Right, clothing, right? And so all I said to them was, I said, I don't do my whole, I'm black, right? So everything I do is representing my culture with this brand. You know what I mean? Uh, so I don't need to, I don't really do the whole black history thing. I'm not against Black History Month at all. Yeah. I'm for Juneteenth, all that. But as far as with a, a white owned brand being like, Want you to do the Black History Month yeah, shoe? Exactly. I'm like, yeah. well, we want you to fucked. dance for get the month. Yeah, you know what I mean. <laughs> so it's like, <laughs> so then I was just like, oh, I'm, I, I'm down to do something, but I just don't want to do black. And then like a week later, this is happened a couple of years ago. You know, I got an email from them like, hey, we we decided not to go forward the collaboration, Jesus which is their God. choice. You know what I mean? And you know, I didn't make a big deal about that. I didn't post it on social media, nothing like that. But stuff like that happens all the time. You know, wow. because of um some of the subject matter that what we represent but also not just the subject matter what we look like yeah you know mm. even it, it's not even about well denim tears goes through this because it's a like I always funny i find it funny when people call i read write-ups and people are like tremaine's like social activist clothing i'm like i i know i know i've read books but you, let's be real though he complains uh, come on tremaine you talk about this stuff all the time though you talk about this stuff all the fucking time what do you expect people to say? Of course, they're going to label your clothes fucking activist fucking wear. I know that's fucking awful to people to say, right? Or like activism garments, but come on. What do you expect? You talk about this shit all the time, brother. Looks on activists. I'm not an activist. I am a commercial designer artist that tells stories of the human condition through clothing through the guys of the African uh, diaspora. Long way to say you're an activist, basically. Come on, Tremaine. I like you, but come on, bro. You're waffling here. Come on. I'm a storyteller that sometimes tells stories about activism. Just, all right. All right. I guess so. 
people who are activists, they don't make clothing. They are active. <laughs> you know what I mean? They're yeah. activists. They're mm, no, there's a, there's a lot of activists there with merch lines. There's a lot of activists with merch lines. Who's that guy that wears, who's that black guy that wears a vest? Is it DeAndre, Deontay? I don't know. With that that guy, that black guy that's always wearing a blue vest. I'm sure he sells those vests, doesn't he? You know what I mean? Like Angela Davis. Yeah. You know what I mean? So I don't I don't like when I get called an activist because I have a lot of respect and it's just a different thing. I'm an artist, designer. <laughs> but, um, you know, I think a, a better even example is of not what I went through. Things I've gone through is um, his last name is M-A-Y-O, Mayo. He's the new head coach of I want everyone who's watching to do this. When you get off, when you finish watching this interview, go to Bleacher Report or whatever and look at the press conference with Robert Kraft and the new black head coach of uh, the Patriots. The Patriots, yeah. I, I heard that. I heard that quote. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, he, and the quote was just, he said, you know, uh, systemic issues are a real thing and they're still here and we have to keep working to change things. Go look at the comments. This they is go like, in on him. Yeah, yeah, this isn't hype. This isn't like streetwear comments. Yeah. This isn't fashion comments. This isn't music. This is sports, America, 50 states. And the stuff people are saying, that's what's going on. Yeah, but it also it also uh, validates how we feel about the Northeast and Massachusetts. And oh, Boston, 100%, which yeah. Which has like, been historically fucking racist. You know what I mean? Like My dad hates Boston because yeah. cause when he was a kid, the pictures of black folk kids being busted in and then white folk on each side spitting on these kids, saying the most horrible things, this, that, and the third. So I say all that to say that is, yes, individual interactions can be beautiful and amazing and this, that, but what systemic is, is the overall umbrella of what yeah. a society sits under. Yeah. And we sit, we, we sit under that. Or actually, we don't sit under the umbrella. We're in the rain. Yeah, like Brandon said, I don't think Instagram comments or social media comments are a good reflection on where we are as a society. They're always going to be a little bit inflamed. They're always going to be inflam inflammatory. They're always going to be a little bit aggressive, a little bit extra, because that's the nature of the internet. It doesn't really... It's not an accurate depiction of how people feel. It's not an accurate accurate gauge of the 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 kind of temperature out there in society at all. If anything, yes, it does provide some insight, but it's not the whole thing. I mean, like I don't know, man. This is a little bit of a confirmation bias thing going on there. You know, and perfect example of you know this guy's the black first head coach of uh, the Patriots. Patriots, and he just makes a statement about. Pretty matter of fact statement about race, and he gets attacked. And the funny part is, a white reporter asked him the question. Well, I was about to say, he, like, he wasn't even like, yeah, you know, it, it wasn't, it wasn't on his own volition, or he had just, which would be just, fine too yeah, if he did. But it, it wasn't, and he was, he was definitely baited into seeing something that was race driven. And you know what? I, I applaud him for being honest because that that takes balls. You know, yeah, he easily could have done the whole like, you know tuck his tail and like no i'm just grateful to be in the room all right peace guys you know what i mean yeah but actually like spoke is true so and, and it was dope that he and what i found beautiful about that interaction between him and robert Kraft was he basically in a way challenged what robert Kraft said because robert said Kraft was like i don't i don't hire based off color i hired him because he's the best man for the job and then he says we you can't be colorblind you have yeah. to you have yeah, to see, yeah. you know, you have to see it. So he's basically challenged, but that can exist in a work environment where a Robert Kraft, super old, super rich white dude. This is a young black man. He's like 37, yeah. who actually played the sport. Not, you know, 80% of the athletes are people of color, mostly black or Hispanic or whatever. And um, Robert Kraft got to say his piece. He said his piece and they can work together. And that's the beauty that this guy, his voice isn't, even though in the comment section, people are trying to choke out his voice yeah. or in the media, but you what, know. Like what you're saying, like. But that's the thing though. He still said what he said. So his voice isn't being silenced. The fact that he was able to say his piece is the most important part. Whatever the comments say are what the comments are. 
if anything, now he's saying this again. I don't really give a fuck, but now he's saying what he's saying about this Gerard, this Gerard Mayo guy. Again, I don't watch football, so I don't really know much about him. I'd love to hear what Tremaine's thoughts are around his relationship. He's very pro-black. He talks about the black experience a lot. Um, how does he wrangle with that in his head with marrying a white woman? What is, again, it doesn't, for me, it doesn't fucking matter. I really don't give a fuck who anybody fucks. Whatever, do whatever you want to do. But in the context of what he's speaking about, couldn't someone put the same question to him and ask him, what, do you see, so what, you, you, do you see colour? Do you not see colour? Why would you, you know what I mean? Like, if if you're all about the black experience, if you're all about fucking furthering or, you know, what you call it, spreading the black message and shit, is that really the right way to go about things? Who knows? Whatever. It doesn't really fucking matter, but still, it's a nonsense question. The, big, the bigger issue also, there's just no black ownership, right, in the NFL. And, and I think, you know, when... There was this kind of like... Also, the black ownership thing in the NFL is annoying because isn't there just no ownership outside of those people that own the fucking football teams? It's not a black or white thing. It's more so like getting the control of those teams out of the group, out getting the control of those football teams from out of the control of a small group of people. You know what I mean? That's what it should be about. Not about, oh, we need more black owners. It should be about, hey, why is it the same people the same types of people own all the fucking things. It's like the DJ thing. It was always really insulting when the whole like, oh, we need more women DJs. It's like, yeah, of course, but we also just need new fresh faces on the scene. We don't want to see the same tired faces every fucking year. It's less about the gender and more so about the freshness and actually not letting it be a monopoly, not letting it be a stranglehold where a certain group of people have all the gigs and everyone else has no none of the gigs. That's what it should be about. But hey, what do I know? Like bum rush of luxury brands or like big, uh, big commercial brands or, and companies like hiring specifically, you know, African American black talent to shoot the campaigns or model in the campaigns yeah. or style the campaigns. Like there were no black or brown creative directors. Yeah. Right. So like, if the creative director role doesn't change, then there isn't really long term change. But also, if there isn't ownership of these brands then the, there's no change period because now where we're at is things are back to regular schedule. Yeah. Well, that's why I bring up the NFL, the situation with um, Coach Mayo to answer your question, is it's a micro for macro for America. Mm -hmm. So, you know, NFL, almost 80% of the players are POCs. Yeah. Um, I've never referred to myself as a POC ever in life. I fucking hate the term. Reducing myself to a fucking acronym, POC. Get fucked. Never, re never refer to myself as a POC. I'd rather someone call me coloured than call me a fucking POC. Like, are you insane? Do I look like a fucking camera utensil? <clears throat> Come on, man. Well, I think ninety some odd percent, or oh, like ninety nine percent, owners are white, and then there's five black coaches. And one's interim. And that one interim coach, I believe he coaches for the Raiders, I could be wrong, said that he, it's quoted in the article about Mayo that he felt NFL is run like a plantation, mm. you know? And it's so the whole thing is being able to speak about these things freely and not being told you're like being woke or why you got to bring up race. Why you got uh, the Being able to talk about it and then... He's talking about himself. Okay, he's talking about himself. Okay, I see what he's talking about. He's relating the Gerard Mayo thing with how he, what he went through with Supreme. I think the difference is that he attributed the fact that he wasn't getting anywhere with Supreme with racism. That's, the, I think, the main issue people had. He attributed some of the pushback he was getting for a design that was pretty racy, that was pretty... No, even for Supreme, they, they've they've done a lot of kind of they've they've had fucking full on, what's the thing? They've had they've had full on hentai on their clothes before. But even for Supreme, it was a bit too much. He's attributing that treatment to racism, which is what a lot of people, myself included, um, debate or no, we push back against and don't agree on. So it's not really the same thing. But I see why he liked this interview. Now he liked that press conference with that Gerald Mayo guy because it reminded him of his experience as Supreme, feeling like he got muzzled, feeling like he's getting silenced, feeling like he's getting gaslit. He was getting manipulated. People weren't letting him, you know, complain. Uh, okay, I see. I see you, Tremaine. That's what can lead to change. Because the thing is, the problems are there. You right. know what I mean? And the problems don't 
change because you opened up a store or that I'm opening up a store. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know, because we're still the minority. If you go, you know, my store's in Soho, yours in LES. How many of the stores are owned by someone that looks like you? How many of the stores in Soho are owned by someone that looks like me? I was about to say, you're about to be number two because that's the thing. When people ask me about the Awake store or about what's so special, I'm like that I'm a native New Yorker. I'm a product of two immigrant parents. I'm Latino. And there's no other streetwear store owner that looks like me. Yeah. Black or brown. Yeah. Below 14th Street. Like, that's a problem. Yeah. Like, I don't see that as something for me to look as like uh something that benefits me or my business because i do believe in strength in numbers and that's something that we've been practicing for the last couple of years right? yeah um but you know kind of like going back to like these kind of like issues like these systemic issues you know like you just recently had uh a challenge with the departure of your last yeah. job you know yeah, what i mean supreme. and that, yeah with, with supreme and that's i don't you know one this isn't no clickbait shit to try to start talking shit about Supreme, but I yeah. think really, it's really like reality. The, the, learn, the learning lesson, right? Yeah. I think like, you know, a lot of kids see what we do mm. and they see the glory, right? The, the glory, the glitz and the glamour of what we do, but really like, what would be your, your you know, like your words um, of advice, you know, for this next generation trying to get these CD roles at places like Supreme or Dior or Vuitton, you know, like, you know, what's the one thing if you would have been able to turn back the clock a year and a half in the middle of those negotiations or talks that you would have been like, you know what? Great question. I need this. Be careful what you wish. For. My advice, I think, if I was him, would be be careful, be careful what you wish for. Not everything that glitters is gold. Great question. I would say slow down. Tranquilo. Ugh. And <laughs> calma, calma, calma. Tranquilo means chill. <laughs> yeah, chill. Con te que dice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and just don't get too... You don't have to say yes mm -hmm. because of what, what your is. family never had or the struggle. Cause so, that's the thing. I, I'm a, you know, I forget talking about Supreme. I could put the onus on myself. Mm. I... Big part of I said yes was because V V passed away. Mm -hmm. So I was like, well, who the kids got that look like them mm -hmm. in a position like that? Right. You know what I mean? Because, you know, V was, you know, V's advice was like, I don't know if you should do it. He's like, V was like, why are they asking us now? You know, you got your thing going. What it would take for you to change that brand culturally? I was like, <sighs> Man, R.I.P. Virgil. R.I.P. to the fucking goat. That's a good point. Why do they want us now? And if you remember, if you know your Virgil Law, you would know that he kind of got shit on a bit. For, I won't say shit on, but, you know, didn't get probably the acknowledge he probably should have got from Supreme or the embracement from them early on when he was, like, doing a lot of teas on his own, working on a little collaboration that never, you know, never saw the light of day. Um, little things like that i wonder why that never come that never happened and then suddenly now the youth are now on his side he's got the kids in the palm of his hands and he's and he's also got the elusive thing because i think a lot of these guys the elusive thing that they have a lot of these brands don't have is that they have those in-between kids they have those kids that like fashion and the kids are like menswear and the kids are like streetwear those kind of kids are like in all three buckets um, a lot of those, you know, Supreme's original fans like myself were mostly in the fucking streetwear bucket. But then over time, some of us grow up and develop interest and taste into fashion and menswear. Some of us don't. Some of us just stick to wearing streetwear stuff. So when you have someone like a Tremaine who's built his own brand that kind of exists in those three buckets, menswear, streetwear and fashion, of course, they're going to be a fucking, you know, appetizing proposition to have because they're gonna you're hopefully you're gonna think they're gonna bring all those people to your brand too and supreme knows they make good enough product that if they get you in through the door they probably got you for life like they've got me for life right like they make good enough products that i know i'm gonna keep buying a brand until the day that i die kind of thing so virgil was right about that do you know what i mean maybe it wasn't the right decision to take it fuck man r.i.p virgil wise guy it's literally the last conversation that would be before we we were in a car going from this dj set at circle loco to the mercer He's like, so what you gonna do about the preem thing? And he's like, I just don't know if it's worth the energy it would take for you to change it culturally. Mm. And they've, they're hollering at you now. You've been, you know, why are they, V always said us, yeah. as you know. Yeah. He was like, why are they hollering at us now? They should have been had someone like us in that position. Mm. So 
I should have talked to you, the couple other people I didn't talk to before, because I was just, I think I was, I was like, I felt, I felt I had Us. to do it. You know, Ace Asa was like, nah. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And not because Supreme sucks. Supreme's a great brand. Um, but because what do you what do you think you can change there? What do you what are you gonna really achieve? Is it is the money and time worth what you're losing for your time in the standard third and what's expected yeah. of you? And the it was a good decision or a good choice for Supreme to hire him. Because it looked like they were being forward thinking. It looked like they had their finger on the pulse. It looked like they were really trying to like shake things up a little bit. I honestly do think it was a smart choice. I really do think it was a smart choice. But, but for the designer, you have to think twice, especially if you built your, like it's different. I think if he was just a guy who was a designer at a brand and they asked him to be a CD, cool, take the role. But when you've built your own thing from the ground up with your bare hands from the fucking mud and you're on your way, you've got your little thing going on, it's becoming a much bigger thing now. You're getting good cosigns and shit. You're getting validation from your peers, from your friends, from the customers and shit. Like, why why bother with the other shit? Just double, triple down on the stuff that you do. You know what I mean? Like, it doesn't... It's, again, not all that shine, just fucking gold. So maybe, you know if you could wind back the clock of time, maybe taking, you know, maybe, maybe having the position where you can maybe do a collab, collaboration, right? That probably might be a way to go forward because who knows? Maybe Supreme have reached out to that. Like, this is crazy, but imagine Supreme reached out to Clint from Cortez. I think he'd say no too, right? Cortez is on the rise. They're popping. They're doing great stuff. Imagine they said to him, hey, you come in, you be the CD. I also don't think it'd be a good choice for him either. Just focus on your brand, the brand that you're building that's becoming a big global force now you know it was, a, it was a fucking one of the best kept secrets in the uk it became a big european brand and now it's becoming a global brand why would you sacrifice all that to just work as supreme just for the fucking title and the fucking whatever it may be when you can't really change much culturally um especially given what tremaine has said about his experience and it's going to take a lot out of you life force wise right if you think of a creative as being like a you know as you said like a jedi there's only a, a certain amount of like powers or a certain amount of level. Like there's only a certain amount that you have per day that you can kind of expend. And you want to put that more in your stuff than other people's stuff. You'd imagine. And the pressure that was, you know, put, put on me to, to, I don't know, make re basically reinvigorate a brand that, you know, had become like a heritage streetwear brand and, mm. You know, it wasn't really popping like it once was because it's just that's what happens over time. It's gonna happen to Denim Tears one day. Mm. It's gonna happen to Wake one day. You know, happen to rap. You know, rap's still around, but it's not popping like it was in the '90s. You know, but it's still great. So that's what I would say to kids: is just really think about your validation index. Why are you doing this? You don't owe nobody nothing. And if it really works for you, cool, go do it. But you don't owe the culture enough and you don't owe, you just do what's best for you and healthiest for you. Agreed. You know, especially if you got your, and also if you have your own brand that's popping, that's the main thing mm -hmm. with the trajectory of, you know, you know, where Denim Tears is at culturally and financially. I didn't need the job. So why'd I take it? Exactly. You know what I mean? And that got nothing to do with supreme that's me right and that's the thing i've been you know working on and that's the advice i you know i would give is just like if you have your own thing that's why correct, exactly. why why are you scared to put in the full time put fully into your own thing Agreed. which you're about to give and work for someone else especially if that thing is like based off our culture you know what i mean which you know supreme partly is you know largely based off of um you know new york Black and brown, black culture. and brown, black mm -hmm. and brown culture. Yeah, a you know? percent. So, that's what I would say to kids: is just like really, really think and really talk to your peers about it. You know, I didn't really do that. I was because I was speeding. Goes back to the conversation about the health and all that other stuff. It's like, mm -hmm. I was speeding off this, that fights, this happened. Boom, V died. Boom, literally, I got the offer the week V. You know, the actual letter the week. V died like Shit. in my like in Miami, you know. 
I should have just been like, guys, I'll talk to you in a month. Mm. One of my best friends just died. So that's on me too, you know what I mean? Yeah. So I would say... So at least he's not being as... Yeah, he's he kind of mellowed out. Since that other interview, he's not as blamey on Supreme. It seems like he's kind of had a bit more perspective on it. So fair play to him. Would you say that was a little ego driven then? Yeah, definitely. Validation yeah. of like having that, getting that stamp. You yeah. know what I mean? Like getting that stamp, like mm. validation, like getting that stamp. Whereas really the only validation I need, I'll give you an example. I went, cause Andy had never been to my old neighborhood. So I took her to Farmer's Day, which is the best day to take her. She can meet all the guys and mm -hmm. stuff. So we went to Farmer's Day, something they've been doing the last three years. And we all hang out by the rock, barbecues, music, like old school, old school shit. And boom, my man Nigel came and the line was mad long for the food. And I'm on my, you know, I'm on my crutch. I said, like, yeah, I can't wait on this line. So Andy and Nigel, what you want to do? I said, yeah, let's go to the, let's go by the fish spot by 40, Pro not far from 40 projects. So Nigel takes us, we get in the car and we drive around this street called the White Wall. Anyway, there was these kids, young kids on four wheelers and one kid had on tank top and the beast story denim to his jeans. That's the only validation I need. Mm. The streets I used to walk as a single digit, double digit teenager, 20 year old, this kid's wearing me and my, 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 my comrades, my friends clothing. Mm. Why do I need any more validation than that? That's the thing I, you know, me and Supreme both played a part in that thing not working out. The part, one of the parts I played in is just like me caring about that validation yeah. of being a creative director. That wasn't, that, that was, that was, was and is my ego, you know? Mm -hmm. and I yeah, fair play, man. Fair play to the guy. Wow, fair play. I'm actually surprised because... I thought he was still going to try and send this message out there that Supreme was the worst and they did this to me and you know, play the victim and, you know, put out all these kind of crazy narratives that really at the end of the day, it just didn't work out. It really isn't that deep, really. Um, they weren't a match culturally. They weren't a match spiritually. They weren't a match artistically. Um, you know, maybe, you know, on paper, it seemed like a good idea. But once they started work, it happens. Sometimes you work a job. Um, you start with the best intentions and you realize, oh, it's just not for me. And again, there could be some racial under there could be some racial undertones there. The James Jebbia guy, as much as I love and appreciate him, he doesn't sound like the greatest leader when it comes to communication, when it comes to delegation, when it comes to micromanagement, all this sort of stuff. I'm sure there were some issues there. I think you also mentioned one really key thing that was an office politics he probably didn't play too well. The lady Erin McGee, who had the legendary um was it legendary but she was around from the beginning um, she had a brand called made me back in the day and she's been a supreme for like two decades plus i think um she was she kind of probably felt i think he said she felt a little bit over she he, he thought she felt overlooked because she was at the brand for so long and she should have got that cd role but then he got it so there was that tension going on um obviously some people probably didn't like him he's cut he's an external hire they're probably very family orientated and close knit kind of group of people. It's hard to kind of get involved there. He's doing his own thing. His priorities are split. You can see why it kind of didn't work out. But it isn't just all a all oh, supreme is a white supremacist brand. Fucking you know um, what's his name? James Jebbia's fucking Stalin, and that's it. I'm glad to be able to take some personal responsibility and accountability for the role that he played in it. Kind of step back and say, you know what? it is what it is and also kind of just learn from those sort of lessons but i don't blame him man the that cd thing even for me someone that doesn't design clothes or hasn't designed clothes yet it's definitely an alluring part it's an alluring fucking role being able to you know say you're a creative director of a brand especially if it's not your brand if it's your brand you can be you can do what the fuck you want right it give yourself whatever role but when someone that hires you to be a creative director of a role or you know proposes that it's nearly impossible to turn down especially if you're like a small streetwear type of person on the come up making your shirts and shit at home you know literally cut and sew your stuff like it's almost impossible to turn down that role so credit him for even taking it you know it didn't work out it is what it is but i'm glad he's being a little bit more reflective and less victimy about it because this sounds like the tremaine that i remember not the other one before that was complaining and being you know what i mean this is more of it i like this that's something i you know i work on for myself just really finding validation and 
you telling me you think I'm one of the the best storytellers, having that be as important as Bernardo No giving me a job. Yeah, exactly, or, exactly, exactly, exactly. Uh, having Bistro willing to do a collaboration with me, these amazing, two uh-huh. amazing designers, have that be just as important as Kim Jones wanting to do a collab with me. You know, um, Kim, he's in the same, actually, I take it back, it's Kim, he's in our tribe, like, he's he's in our tribe, but y'all know what I'm saying, or like, shop, uh, the shop guy tribe. Huh? The shop yeah, guy, shop yeah, guy tribe, for real. Work at Hideout. Work, so. work for Hideout, work yeah. for Michael Copperman. Yeah. But, um, you know, just finding, getting the main validation for myself. Am I happy with what I did? And then the second level of validation, if you're even going to go there, from my tribe. And and also, really, it's about, and my man Anthony, my business partner, told me this. He said, Tremaine, it's just about you and, the, and the, your art and the customer. Yeah. Not even the customer. You don't even got to buy dinner tears. It's about, you might just watch the videos. Mm-hmm. That's all that matters. Everything else is noise. And that's the that's the advice I could give is it's about you and the viewer. Everything else is is noise and spend your time as far as when it comes to your you know, art and designing is thinking about the person that's taking their time, valuable time, to watch your videos, come to your store, buy your spend their money where they can spend it on anything else, on your stuff. Repost your stuff, like it, tell their friends about it. Focus on them. They're the, they're the they're the most important. They're the most important thing. That's very true, and it also reminds me of uh, what was I gonna say. That's probably the part of the reason why Supreme is so popular still until this day. Supreme have done a great job of that, of just focusing on their customer, focusing on the product, focusing on putting out the fucking clothes. You know, that's what, that's been, always been, I always felt like their singular mission is just to keep putting out great collections every fucking season. Nothing else, not, no other nonsense, just great collections, great accessories, great fucking, you know, knickknacks and whatnot, um, great collaborations, bit, some video content here and there, but nothing else too crazy, just great, great clothes, great collections year after year, and then, keep, you know, let the chips fall where they may. Besides... You being, and then the most important thing is you being good with the work. So that's the thing. One of the things I learned from that situation, I I should have thought about that more before I signed that contract. You know what I mean? Props. But you live and you learn. Props. It was a great experience. I met Props. Andy there, so it was great. Maybe. I mean, that's a big benefit. You got yourself a wife out of it. Yeah. Um, oh, shit, really? That was quick, isn't it? He was only there for a year. Fuck, you know. Okay, fair play for him. I feel good. How you feeling, Tremaine? How you feel? Good. You feel good? Yeah. I feel like we covered a lot. A lot. I feel like we covered a lot. I don't know if it's the clickbait that most people are going to tune in looking for, but um, I really hope that you walk away with a brand new perspective on Tremaine, also myself, and in our friendship and and our kinship. Um, Any parting words? Um, You know what? Parting words, I appreciate all the... There's just once in a blue, a lot of people come up to me a lot in the street. I appreciate the people that are just like, yo, we happy you you doing you doing better. Mm. You know, I read the, anyone that took time to like just paid attention to what I've been going through um health wise and the people that made comments about paid attention to that and made comments about that in the streets. I appreciate that a lot. That's cause you don't gotta say nothing. Mm-hmm. You could just be like, I wanna take a picture. Or, yo, that drop was dope. So someone being like, yo, I'm happy you're out the wheelchair. Or, yo, how's your health? A stranger saying that to you? I respect that. Amazing. I appreciate that. Because yeah. I don't always, I be keeping it moving. I just say thank you. I might seem like the Grinch, but I'm not the Grinch. I really, it hits me. It really warms my heart. But also it's a testament that New Yorkers are not assholes. Nah, you know yeah, nah, I, know you t- I know you're specifically talking about New York. New York, I'm talking about New York, Because that's the yeah. love I get here. Yeah. When I get the random kid like, yo, we see you. We fuck with you. And it's always on the day that I'm like, I don't want to do this shit no more. Yep. <laughs> I'm done. I don't give a fuck about t-shirts or any shit. And I'll get like the random fucking little Colombian Ecuadorian kid like, yo, thank you for what you're doing. I fuck with Real you. Talk. I'm just like, okay, cool. I guess I'm doing the right thing. So, Real talk. That It hits, it like really hits me in, in the heart when, uh, you know, sometimes it be grown ass men or grown ass women. It's not about just kids, you know, but just someone that just, 
speaks on the work or speaks on me as a human being. I don't ever take any of those interactions for granted. I wish I could, I wish I had time or my legs just felt better and I could just stand there and talk mm. to them, but I gotta get off my leg, get off my feet and keep it moving. Mm. Or, you know, I'm I'm, on, I'm in a rush, but I really, that's the most part in words is I appreciate, especially this last year and a half, I appreciate everyone that's uh, come up to me in the streets. Okay. Big up Tremaine, really good interview. Big up Angela Back, really good um, interview -er or interview host, whatever the fucking term is did a great job i think their connection friendship whatever did definitely help to make him feel more comfortable and relaxed and we got some good answers and good um what you got we got some good questions and good answers out of tremaine it's good to see that he's a little bit more level-headed and not as kind of you know annoyed by the whole supreme thing and be able to look at it from his perspective be able to look at it from the other perspective as well um that's been great to see and obviously some other tidbits in there that we probably didn't know so credit to them all involved really fucking good interview